Since the war between Russia and Ukraine broke out, China resumed sending its warplanes into Taiwan's air defense zone. North Korea fired a ballistic missile. The Iranian Revolution Guard Corps sent 12 missiles targeting the U.S. consulate in northern Iraq. And now one of the United States allies, Saudi Arabia, is considering pricing its oil sales to Beijing in Chinese renminbi. These events remind me of the strategy proposed by a CCP advisor who said China should make sure that at any time the United States is entangled with at least three enemies. It prompted me to revisit his six strategies for overtaking the United States as the world's only superpower. Hello everyone, I'm Lei. Welcome to my show. Welcome to Lei's Real Talk. Professor Jin Chanrong is the Vice Dean of the School of International Relations at Renmin University. He's nicknamed the Master of State. As people say, he advises the Chinese leadership and likes to give daring talks. On July 23, 2016, he gave a lecture titled Strategic Philosophy of Sino-U.S. Relations in Guangzhou. It was he who mentioned the six strategies for the CCP to eventually keep the United States under control. But before I get into that, let's first take a look at what's happening in the Middle East. The Gulf region is key to Beijing's energy supply and geopolitical influence. In January, the foreign ministers of Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, and the Secretary General of the Gulf Cooperation Council for the Arab States visited China to discuss trade and security issues. As Axios reported, the spate of visits by Gulf officials was part of a push by the CCP to become more deeply involved in Middle East affairs. More worrisome is the fact that China is now gobbling up the Gulf region and turning those countries with power against the United States. The Wall Street Journal reported on March 8th that leaders from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates declined calls with Biden during the Ukraine crisis as they are growing increasingly unhappy with the United States over its policies in the region. The journal reported that Saudi Arabia has relied on Chinese technology to build its own ballistic missiles, and China was suspected of secretly building a military facility near the UAE capital of Abu Dhabi. Last December, the United Arab Emirates suspended an arms purchase with the United States worth up to $23 billion because the UAE believed the U.S. had attached too many conditions, including a ban on the use of Chinese Huawei's 5G equipment. China has seen an opportunity because of Washington's preoccupation with the Indo-Pacific region and its tensions with the Arab states. One of the Atlantic Council's articles best summarizes the situation. China is trying to create a wedge between the U.S. and Gulf allies. Data from the IMF shows that 55% of the world's foreign reserves are held in the American dollar, and only 2.48% are held in Chinese yuan. If Saudi Arabia settles its oil sales to China with the renminbi, it will hurt the American dollar's dominance in the global market and help China with its renminbi globalization plan because other commodities such as metals, soybeans, may start to be traded in yuan. The United States for decades has underestimated the CCP's ambitions. The Marxist claim of liberating all mankind fundamentally drives the ambition of the communist regime, whose ultimate goal is to bring down the United States and dominate the world. I can only add to it that no government in the world is as tactically comprehensive and strategic as the CCP in their planning to achieve this goal. During Deng Xiaoping's time in 1987, the CCP formally announced a three-step strategy at its 13th National Congress to reach its goals. The first step was to solve the problem of basic survival by being able to feed the Chinese people. The second step was to move the country into relative prosperity by the end of the 20th century. And the third step was to take about 50 years to enter the ranks of mid-tier developed countries by 2050. Ten years later, during Jiang Zemin's time, the CCP revised the plan and proposed the two centennial goals 
at the 15th National Congress in 1997. One, to build a moderately prosperous China by 2021, to celebrate the CCP's centennial anniversary, and two, to build a socialist powerhouse by 2049, to commemorate a century of Chinese communist rule. During Xi Jinping's time, the 19th National Congress in 2017 inherited the same timetable but moved up the goal of modernizing the military by 15 years, from 2049 to 2035. In October 2020, the plan was moved even closer by adding a new goal of integrated mechanical, informational, and intelligence development for the military by the year 2027. This very goal-oriented strategic planning that spans a century is probably unprecedented in the history of modern government. The governments of the democratic world serve their people and aim to maintaining peace and well-being of their citizens. They don't have any century-long ambitions. Moreover, the increasingly militant overtones of the CCP's strategic planning should concern peace-loving people worldwide. During Mao Zedong's era, the CCP closed the borders, destroyed traditional Chinese culture, and brainwashed its people. During Deng Xiaoping's era, the CCP established diplomatic relations with the United States, utilized the Chinese people's obedience and hard work, along with Western technology and investments, to grow into the world's second largest economy. Now the CCP feels strong enough to call for a new world order, and is quite open about its goal to become the only superpower in the world. Professor Jing summarized the process descriptively. Mao Zedong let the new communist China survive. Deng Xiaoping let China develop. Now Xi Jinping will let China have dignity. After this is achieved, we'll enter the fourth stage. But that's the responsibility of our next generation. Our generation will achieve equal status with the U.S., our next generation will take the U.S. under control. Professor Jin detailed six strategies to overtake the United States. The first strategy is to develop and grow China steadfastly. He claims that once China develops to a certain size, to be as strong as the United States, the U.S. will be forced to accept it. Jin explained this view in one of his recent interviews. The second strategy is to expand China's footprint globally without causing a direct confrontation with the United States such as the Belt and Road Initiative and the building of islands in the South China Sea. I believe China's expansion in the Middle East fits into this strategy. The third strategy is to expand cooperation with the United States, reducing competition between the two countries to 30% and increasing cooperation to 70%. This will create a situation where the two countries would depend on each other. The fourth strategy is to reach deep into the U.S. and resolve to negotiate the Sino-U.S. Bilateral Investment Protection Agreement to access and control the U.S. market. The negotiation of this agreement started during the Obama administration, and the CCP hoped to continue the dialogue with Hillary Clinton in the White House. But the result of the 2016 election changed that. The fifth strategy is to have Chinese investments in every U.S. congressional district so as to control thousands of votes in each district. Professor Jin did his calculation. He said that there are about 750,000 voters on average in each district, and only 30% of people vote. That's about a quarter of a million votes. If China can control thousands of votes, that's enough to decide the result. The sixth strategy is to ensure that the United States has four enemies at any one time. He said, If the United States has three external enemies, I reckon it will be disoriented. With four enemies, it will be losing its mind. 
China's strategic task is to ensure that they have four enemies. Terrorists are certainly one. Russia is very likely one. That's not enough. China tried to turn Brazil into one. In short, this is a strategic idea. Professor Jin has studied the United States for 30 years and is regarded as an expert on America and an advisor to Xi Jinping. I hope American policymakers can take what he said to heart and not lose track. That's all for today. I thank you and I'll see you soon.